So you want to go to space, of course you do, and luckily for us, human spaceflight is finally becoming accessible to people outside the elite ranks of the astronauts. This is almost entirely thanks to the revolutionary vehicle that is the SpaceX Crew Dragon. There has never before been an easier, more convenient, or cheaper way to put human beings into outer space. And I mean real space, not that virgin blue origin little hop over the line of technicality. We are going to orbit, friends, and this is what it's going to be like. This is the Space Race. Let's meet our chariot to the gods, the SpaceX Dragon Capsule. This goes back to the very early days of SpaceX and was one of the first products they developed alongside the Falcon 9. Version 1 of the Dragon Capsule began operation in 2010 as a supply ship for the ISS and flew 23 cargo missions over 10 years. This proven success and reliability led SpaceX to develop Dragon 2 in 2014 with support from the NASA Commercial Crew Program. Dragon 2 completed its first demo flight in 2019, and on May 30th, 2020, became the first American rocket to fly a crew into orbit since the Space Shuttle. Actually, Dragon was the first US-made crew-rated space capsule since the Apollo program, so this was a much-needed vehicle. Unlike those old Apollo capsules that were cramped, industrial, and confronted astronauts with a dashboard full of esoteric lights, switches, and meters that they could never fully understand, the Dragon is sleek and modern, both inside and out. The capsule itself is 16 feet tall by 13 feet wide, and it sits on top of the trunk section, which adds another 12 feet in length. This is the main source of power for the Dragon, and also serves as a literal trunk for unpressurized cargo. The Dragon has one mechanical hatch located in the tip of the nose cone that reveals either a docking port or a cupola window, depending on the mission profile, and one side door for the crew to enter and exit while on Earth. The exterior of the Dragon is painted in SpaceX white and is perfectly smooth, revealing only a couple of small windows and the various thruster ports. There are two kinds of propulsion on the Dragon. Draco thrusters are grouped into small clusters all around the capsule, with nozzles pointing out at different angles. There are 16 of them in total, and this is how SpaceX maneuvers the vehicle and controls orbital altitude. Each thruster is a tiny rocket engine that uses hypergolic propellant, which means two chemicals that self-combust on contact are combined in the thrust chamber to generate force. Super Dracos are the capsule's main engines. They are concealed inside the four large ridges that surround the Dragon with two engines per ridge. These are high-thrust hypergolic rocket engines that are around 200 times more powerful than the maneuvering thrusters. Super Dracos are also capable of deep throttling control. SpaceX had originally experimented with the idea of using these engines for a propulsive landing of the Dragon capsule, but ended up scrapping that in favor of the more tried-and-true parachute ocean landing. Now, ideally, we don't want to see these Super Draco engines in action during our flight. These are abort system engines, and their only job is to get the crew as far away from the rocket booster as fast as possible before something explodes. This is why the trunk section is fitted with aerodynamic fins. They obviously don't serve any purpose in space, and the Falcon 9 doesn't need them for launch. Those fins are to keep the Dragon stable in the event that it has to fly through the air on its own. Inside the Dragon is where things get even more unconventional. The interior volume is huge by space capsule standards, with 9.3 cubic meters of pressurized volume, and can seat four passengers comfortably. By comparison, the currently used Russian Soyuz vehicle has just around four cubic meters of habitable space in its descent module, and carries three people max. Ahead of the crew is a simple layout of three large touchscreen monitors, and that's it. No analog controls, and that's because as a modern spacecraft, Dragon flies fully autonomously, and if there is any need for manual input, it's done remotely by the ground crew, not the passengers. This makes perfect sense, but even the Boeing Starliner that was developed at the same time as the crew Dragon still has a giant panel of buttons, switches, and levers, so Dragon is still very unique. Okay, so we know our vehicle, now we need to prepare for launch. It's time to suit up. Each SpaceX crew member is going to receive their own custom-tailored pressure suit and 3D printed helmet. The suit is designed to maintain an Earth-like condition on the inside 
even in a total vacuum. So that means breathable air, stable temperature, and most importantly, an atmospheric pressure comparable to Earth's sea level. Obviously, we don't want to suffocate, but a pressure loss is a definite worst case scenario because a lowered ambient pressure will lower the boiling point of water, and eventually your blood will start to vaporize inside your body. So let's not do that. Just like those Super Draco engines, we don't want to actually see these pressure suits do their job, because that means something has gone terribly wrong, but we are happy to have them just in case. Unlike previous flight suits that were bulky and modular, the SpaceX one is thin, flexible, and all one piece, so you just unzip the inseam of the pants and kind of go in from the bottom. All of your communication systems and vital signs monitoring is going to be built into the flight helmet. On the day of the launch, things are going to happen pretty fast. At three hours prior to launch, we begin to suit up in the NASA Space Flight Center and get a final technical briefing before the main event. The crew of four outfitted in flight suits are then ferried to the launch site in a fleet of Tesla Model X SUVs. The Falcon Wing side doors make it incredibly easy to hop in and out with the suit on. Around one hour prior to launch, we take an elevator up 255 feet to the crew access arm of the launch tower. At the top, there's a landline telephone if you want to say any final words to friends and family. Just a reminder that flying to space on a rocket is an incredibly dangerous activity. Next, we traverse the walkway to the awaiting dragon. The ground crew helps us in through the capsule's side door and secure us down to the seats. The heels of your boots have a clip that secures your legs into the floor so they don't jostle around during launch. The life support tether from your chair plugs into a port on the thigh of your flight suit, and this allows a flow of cooled nitrogen and oxygen to move through your suit, maintaining temperature and air quality. At this point, the flight suit is fully integrated with the Dragon capsule. The onboard computer is monitoring your vital signs and providing a customized life support experience. It's all quite luxurious. At around T-45 minutes, the ground crew is going to bid us all farewell and seal the capsule. Then the crew access arm will retract. Once the arm is clear, we are going into final countdown prep. Visors down on the helmets and secured into the seats, we need to arm the launch escape system. This is one of the very few operations that has to be done from within the capsule. We are going to hear a very loud thump as the hypergolic fuel tanks are primed for the Super Draco engines. If SpaceX detects any kind of anomaly in the Falcon 9 booster on ascent, then those eight engines will fire up to 16,000 pounds of thrust per nozzle in about 100 milliseconds, and that is going to propel the Dragon away from the rocket at a blistering speed. It's not going to be fun, but the Dragon will travel about half a mile in just seven seconds. Next up, we are going to begin propellant loading of the Falcon 9. This is unique for SpaceX to fuel the rocket with the crew on board. Typically, it's done the other way around, but there are only two other crew-rated rockets in the world right now, so what's typical? From the cockpit, we're actually going to be able to hear the valves opening and the ultra-chilled propellant flowing through the rocket. It's supposedly like a fluttering sound and a low hum. In the meantime, we have our three display screens that provide all of the information about the rocket and the status of the flight plan. Basically, everything that you normally see on a SpaceX livestream, plus even more technical data. And then there's the final countdown and liftoff. The nine Merlin engines at the base of the Block 5 Falcon booster are going to generate about 1.8 million pounds of thrust. After just 30 seconds, the rocket will be traveling 500 kilometers per hour at an altitude of two kilometers above sea level. One minute into the flight, the rocket will break the sound barrier and reach supersonic speed. Assuming everything goes smooth and we don't need to abort, the next major event comes at around 2 minutes and 30 seconds, when the booster engines cut off and we have the first stage separation. Now we are moving at over 6,000 km per hour at an altitude of over 80 km and the upper stage vacuum engine has kicked on to bring us to orbital velocity. Around 9 minutes into flight, we reach 27,000 km per hour and 200 km of altitude. The second engine has done its job and shuts down. We are now experiencing zero Gs, and that should be indicated by a floating stuffed animal in the capsule. Assuming we have good orbital insertion, at around 12 minutes, the second stage will separate from the Dragon, and we are simply coasting in space, circling the Earth. After 15 minutes, we can go visors up 
and unbuckle from the seats to begin free floating in the capsule. At this point, the flight suits are no longer needed. Thankfully, we're through the most dangerous period for now. At this point, we are looking at one of two mission profiles. If we are on our way to the ISS, then it's going to take about one day for the capsule to slowly move into a rendezvous trajectory to meet the station and dock. In this case, we are going to manually unwind the nose cone cap to reveal a docking port that we'll use to transfer into the ISS. But that's not all the Dragon capsule is being used for these days. We could be some of the lucky few who have taken this vehicle out for a pleasure cruise through low Earth orbit, much like the Inspiration4 crew as seen in the Netflix documentary series. That mission profile spends around three days in orbit, and since the docking port is not going to be necessary, SpaceX outfits the Dragon with a cupola window that is revealed underneath the nose cone, and it's a glass dome that you can fit your whole head inside and see the entire perimeter of the Earth, all at the same time. Alright, eventually someone's gonna have to use the space toilet, so let's talk about it. Luckily, this is something that has gotten a lot more dignified over the history of human spaceflight. Alan Shepard, the first American in space, had to pee his own pants in the Mercury capsule. This evolved into a tube that the astronauts would stick their junk into. They were only sending dudes to space back then, and as longer duration spaceflight became a thing, astronauts were issued a sack for their... yeah. Anyway, that's now evolved into a vacuum suction-powered toilet that was first installed on the space shuttle and is also used on the ISS. The Dragon has one too, it's just above the side door, kind of in the ceiling from the crew's perspective. The unit is kind of sewed away in an alcove built into the wall. It's basically a collection of fans, valves, suction hoses, dehumidifiers, and storage tanks. You also do get a curtain for privacy. Apparently, the zero-g environment has a pretty immediate and unpredictable effect on your body systems, and astronauts have reported that everybody ends up using the space toilet within a couple of hours into the flight, so you can't just hold it. Okay, so we've either completed our stay on the ISS or enjoyed a couple days soaring high above the world as space tourists. Either way, we need to get back down. There are seven potential landing sites along the Florida coast, either in the Gulf of Mexico or the open Atlantic Ocean. The ground crew is going to determine which landing site is the most optimal according to weather conditions and other safety factors. The SpaceX team at Mission Control is going to begin to gradually move the Dragon into its final orbital trajectory, basically just steadily dropping the perigee, which is the lowest altitude of each orbit, until the Dragon is on course to re-enter the atmosphere. This is where things get dangerous again, so it's suits on, visors down, and strapped in for the ride. When all systems are go, the Dragon capsule is going to separate from the trunk module and the Draco thrusters will fire to point the heat shield down towards the Earth and set the final approach angle. From here, the Draco thruster can still autonomously make small adjustments to our trajectory as we fall. Worst of all, the communication system is going to go dead for 7 minutes through the most intense period of re-entry, so if anything goes wrong, we won't have any warning about it. We will just explode. Not that we could really do anything about it anyway. The capsule is going to come in at a speed of around 28,000 kilometers per hour, and that is going to impact the air with so much force that the gases will compress and combust into screaming hot plasma, reaching around 1900 degrees Celsius. The heat shield tires are absorbing that energy and then partially vaporizing. This is what's called an ablative heat shield. By having the outer layer of the tiles purposefully erode away, they are moving heat buildup away from the capsule. We are going to remain at a pretty comfortable temperature inside the flight suit, with the capsule life support system flowing cooled air through the umbilical connection that is then distributed throughout the suit. The resistance from the atmosphere is going to slow the Dragon down to just 560 km per hour, which is going to exert a force of between 4 and 5 times the force of Earth's gravity on the crew inside. We are going down back first, so it's not going to feel like whiplash in a car will be pushed into the seat just like at liftoff. Once the fire has dissipated, the communication system is going to come back online and the ground crew is going to let us know to prepare for chute deployment. First, two drogue chutes go for the initial slowdown, and those are followed by four main chutes, and that brings the speed down to just 24 km per hour before splashdown. Once in the water, we are going to be met by a SpaceX crew on a barred ship, 
they are going to get the capsule hooked up to a crane and lifted on deck. At this point, the pristine white paint on the dragon is going to be charred into different shades of grey and black, but we are going to be safe and comfortable inside as we wait for the all clear to open the hatch. Before they can get us out, the crew has to plug all of the Draco thruster nozzles, the hypergolic fuel is incredibly toxic, and we want to make sure that no one gets a face full of vapor. So, the ship's crew are all wearing respirator masks during this onboarding procedure. Once we're sure that the toxic gas has dissipated, then the capsule slides over the egress platform and the side door gets popped open. From there, the crew is assisted as they awkwardly have to crawl and slide out of the capsule. Depending on how long we were just in space, we may or may not be able to walk with some assistance to keep our balance. And that's it. We just went to space and back again. From here, the dragon is going to be fully refurbished so that the capsule can do the whole process all over again. And that is what life inside a SpaceX Dragon capsule is like. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.